In the village of Kurtal, the news had drifted in from the neighboring valley of Broly. Winter and Saxo were climbing the citadel. They are fools! They will be killed! There are three men, not two, on the citadel! I have seen them through the great telescope on the veranda of the Bosite Hotel, heading up the snow slope toward the southeast ridge. Then they disappeared! And the third man? Who is the third? Franz Lerner knew the name of the third, and the knowledge sickened him. Angrily, he informed the villagers that it was Rudy on the mountain with the others. Then he quickly organized a team of Kurtal guides to follow the climbers, not to join in the futile assault on the citadel, but to bring his foolish nephew back. You call the boy a fool. I call him the son of his father. And what do you call yourselves? Men? But you are not. You're like a herd of sheep, a crowd of old women. There is just one real mountain man in all the valley. And he is a boy of 16 called Rudy Matt. Of the three climbers, only Captain Winter had suffered an injury in the avalanche, a gash in his forehead when he was thrown against a boulder. Back at the hut, his head bandaged, he made plans for the attack on the citadel. There must be a way past the fortress. I feel it won't be straight up and over, but off to the left, to the south of the ridge. That was Joseph Matt's way before the accident. We'll start tomorrow, sir? No, Rudy, no. First, Saxo and I must go down to Broly for more food and supplies. And you will go down to Kurtal to ask your uncle once more if he will join us. At this, Emil Saxo was furious. Like his fellow villagers, he despised all Kurtalas. Forget your prejudices, Emil. And if Lerner will come, accept him. Let's go after this mountain in the strongest way, not as an Englishman and a Swiss, not as a man from Broly and a man from Kurtal, simply as human beings working together. The citadel is too great for anything else, too important. Rudy watched the men go, sad in the knowledge that he would have to disobey Captain Winter. He could not risk returning to Kurtal, he could not. Rudy knew that alone he could not reach the top of the citadel. All he wanted was to follow where his father had led, to reach the fortress which was as high as any man had gone. Then he would go back to the village, to his uncle's anger, his mother's tears. Following the trail made the day before, Rudy climbed higher and higher to what seemed the top of the world. Then he was there at the base of the fortress, 4,000 feet below the peak of the citadel. Rudy wanted to shout, but a shout would have been a blasphemy in that high secret world to which he had come at last. He glanced to the left, where he saw what he had hoped to see, the one break in the great cliff's defenses. About five yards beyond, a long cleft or chimney slanted upward through the otherwise unbroken rock. So there was a way past the fortress, a key to the upper mountain which his father had found 15 years before. Rudy knew he should start down, but a magic drew him on. He inched his way up the cleft, and at last he emerged on a flat shelf above the cliff face, the first human being to have passed the grim barrier of the fortress. Rudy's joy overcame him, to be alone like this, alone in the emptiness, in the stillness. What was that sound? Rudy looked up. The sky was gray, the sun shrunken and remote. A plume of snow streamed out across the darkening sky as Rudy lowered himself back into the cleft to work his way down to the base of the fortress. A new terror gripped Rudy as he heard the rumble high above, a rock fall, here in the same spot where 15 years before an avalanche of boulders had come crashing down on Joseph Matt and his party. Not a rock fall after all, a storm. Frantically, Rudy looked for shelter. It was too late to go back to the hut. He would have to spend the night here. Searching for some sort of shelter along the wall of the fortress, he found a hollowed out section of rock and crept into it. Shivering with cold, Rudy took the old red shirt from his pack, pulled it on over his clothes. Then suddenly, as he realized where he was, 
he was overcome with fright. The demons of the mountain seemed to speak to him. This is the cave, the cave in which your father and Sir Edward Stevenson died. Father! Father! The words spoken aloud calmed him. He was wearing Joseph Matt's red shirt, and in that shirt, he slept at last on Joseph Matt's mountain. At the first light, Rudy rose and looked down into the mist. He would go down, back to the hut. He would not fall. He would make it. Franz Lerner and the party from Kurtal had arrived at the hut. Captain Winter and Saxo had already returned with the supplies. Where is the boy? Rudy? But I sent him to Kurtal. He... he didn't arrive? Oh, what will I tell his poor mother? It is your fault, Saxo. If it were not for you, this Englishman would not be here. The boy would not have come. I do not take such talk from a Kurtala. Braggart! Howard! Oh, stop it, both of you. You're each as bad as the other, fighting over your villages while the boy is... Bent with tiredness, Rudy clung to the doorway. Tattered, caked with dirt and snow, streaks of blood showed on his cheeks and fingers. But his lips were smiling. His eyes shone. I found it. I have found the way. Oh, Rudy, thank God you're alive. I have found the way, past the fortress, the key to the citadel. Warmed by tea, food, and dry clothes, Rudy told of his discovery. But in spite of Winters and Old Teo's pleas, Franz Lerner still insisted he would take the boy back down to Kurtal. Tell me the truth. Did you men come here because of the boy? We came because of Saxo, too. He has no business here. This hut belongs to us of Kurtal. The citadel is the mountain of Kotal. You mean the mountain of Broly? I have circled and explored the citadel's roots for ten years. While you, there's been no Kotal guide since Joseph Matt, who is not afraid even to look at it. You think we are all cowards, Saxo, huh? I think what I see. Captain Winter had to come to Broly to find his guide. I am not a coward. I have come here to climb it. <laughs> You'll be the first, eh? But I shall be on the summit first, rolling stones down at you. Stop it, stop it! We are all going together. No! No! We are going together. Or I, for one, am not going at all. Are you men or children? The Citadel will have none of this quarreling and fighting each other. Those who get to the top will never do it that way. But by helping each other, by working together. Now, shake hands. It is settled. Tomorrow's the day. On to victory, the three of you. No, no, not three. But four. Am I right, Franz? There will be four of us. You are feeling all right, boy? Yes, Uncle. For you, my captain, I am doing strange things. God grant I shall not live to regret it. The men made their plans. Four would go. Old Teo and the others who had come with Franz would wait at the hut. One man, however, would go back to the village immediately to bring word of what was happening. Most important, he would deliver a message from Franz to Frau Matt. My sister must be out of her mind with worry. Tell her we have found the boy, that he's here at the hut, and all right. But for the love of God, don't tell her he is on the mountain. And Old Teo had a final word for Rudy. Remember what you have learned, boy. When in doubt, ask yourself what your father would have done. I will, Teo. I will. And come down quickly, boy, or our kitchen will be full of dirty dishes. By sunrise the next day, the four climbers were on their way. On and up they climbed, sometimes stopping to rest or for a bite of food, often with Rudy in the lead. The sun was brilliant. Soon they were sweating from their exertions, removing their outer jackets. At last, the fortress. Rudy moved along the platform toward the south face and showed them what he had discovered. You would listen to a boy. I tell you, that is not a good way. But Captain Winter was determined to try Rudy's way. The hand-cut pole that was strapped to the boy's back scraped as he started his ascent up the narrow shaft, the others behind him. That pole of yours, take it off! 
Rudy climbed on, pretending he had not heard his uncle. He would be careful. He would adjust the staff. But abandon it now? Never. In a few minutes, they were out of the cleft and on the flat top of the fortress. The boy's lead had been masterful in its skill. Even Saxo voiced a grudging admiration. Yeah, it was all right. But my way, straight up the wall, would have been better. That night, the climbers found a level place sheltered enough for a campsite and pitched their two small tents. Winter and Saxo in one tent, Rudy and his uncle in the other. Captain Winter's head injury had weakened him. He ate little of their pre-dawn breakfast and kept putting his hand to his still bandaged head. Is it hurting you, my captain? Oh, um, well, Franz, it, uh, it's nothing. When they started the climb, Winter kept pace. But his face was strained, his movements slower than before. Their breath, uneven in the thinning air, fingertips bloody from clawing at rock, the men moved haltingly over bulges, crags, buttresses. With Saxo in the lead, they came finally to the needle, a thin column of rock poised like a pointing finger in the sky. Above it, sweeping on to the left, was the broad, snow-covered flat of the shoulder of the citadel. Once there, they would be on easier ground and within striking distance of the summit. The outside wall of the needle provided few footholds, but Saxo found a cleft in the rock that might give them access to the shoulder. It was still only mid-morning, and with luck, they could reach the shoulder. Saxo reappeared, discouraged. The cleft had become so narrow that no man could pass through to reach the shoulder of the citadel. Unable to accept Saxo's theory, Franz went up, but like him, returned defeated. Rudy, because he was so small, convinced the men to let him try it. Up the cleft, around the turning, for some 30 feet the climbing was easy. Rudy's only hope was that the rope should not foul on some projection beneath him. Then the walls closed in. The rock was wet and slippery, the walls a sudden bottleneck. At one point, Rudy stuck and could move neither up nor down. He fought for air. Are you? Answer! Miraculously, the boy struggled out of his trap, continued up the black walls, his heart leaping as grayish light appeared at the end of the shaft. Now, he crawled out onto the rim. He was standing in snow, in bright sunlight, on the shoulder of the citadel. Rudy had climbed up past the needle, through the needle's eye. He tied one end of the rope around a knob of rock and lowered the other down the outside wall. With Rudy's help, the climbers were now able to make the ascent up the sheer face of the needle. Soon, all four stood together on the shoulder of the citadel. And Franz put his arms around Rudy and held him tight. <coughs> My captain, you are ill. We must stop now. Up ahead, the snow ends. There's a good place for the tents. In the morning, when you are better, we will go to the top. No. If we camp here, we could lose our chance. Oh, I, I beg of you, leave me here. Go to the top. Saxo is right. The weather could change. Well, if the captain insists. It is not a question of what the captain insists, but of what a guide must do. A guide of Courtal does not leave his employer on a mountain. What a guide of Broly does, I, of course, do not know. Saxo glared, but he was silent, and the tents were pitched. When Rudy awoke, it was still dawn, but Saxo was gone. Rudy's thoughts were in turmoil. Were the three of them to remain here, miserable and impotent, while the evil Saxo climbed on to glory? His heart pounding, Rudy claimed his boots, axe, and pack. He made the pack lighter by removing all but the red shirt. The hand-carved pole strapped to his back, Rudy moved up through the gray stillness of the new day. On the ridge near the final pyramid, Rudy caught up with Saxo. The guide's ice-blue eyes glared. Go back, boy. The citadel is not for you yet, nor any Kotala. I shall climb it alone. In the name of Broly will be known forever. No, 
No! Let me come with you! Please! Angrily, Saxo wheeled on the boy, and in that instant lost his balance. <laughs> Horrified, Rudy watched as the big man slid to a narrow ledge 20 feet below. Rudy was alone, mountain and sky spinning around him. Throwing himself flat, he clung to a boulder till the spinning stopped. Then, after an upward look at the shining pinnacle of the citadel, he knew he must help Saxo. He studied the sheer wall beneath him, found a foothold, let himself slowly down. But the pack with the red shirt and the staff on his back seemed to pull him relentlessly off into space. Rudy crept back to the ridge, unslung them, and laid them on a rock. Soon Rudy was on the narrow ledge beside Saxo, who cursed and groaned with pain. The guide's arm was broken and he had injured his leg. The boy tried to support him up the wall, each attempt failing. There were ugly bruises on Rudy's shoulder where Saxo's boot nails had ripped through to the boy's flesh. Again, Rudy stole a longing look upward. The top was so close. His brain spinning, Rudy moved to the other side of the ledge. There was a way out, he saw, but it led down, not up. Go on, you fool. You've won, don't you understand? Go on. Get your shirt and pull and put them on the top. You'll be a hero, the conqueror of the Citadel, your father's son. No, I have found the way down. You will need my help. With Saxo's useless arm and injured leg, even the simplest of maneuvers became a formidable problem. Rudy had to help him almost constantly. His shoulder, torn by Saxo's boot nails, seemed shot through with darts of fire. He looked up to see how far they had come, and his heart stopped. For high above on the ridge were two human figures, Captain Winter and his uncle. In that stillness of rock and ice, they would surely hear him and come to his aid, but if he did not call them, they would keep going. In less than half an hour, they could reach the shining summit of the citadel, if he did not call them. How could one frail boy support the weight of a heavy man down the mountain? Rudy knew only that he had to. He staggered, fell, lay sprawled with his burden upon crags, could not get up again, did get up again. Down, down, Saxo falling, Rudy helping him up, and finally the sky spinning, darkness. When Rudy opened his eyes, Captain Winter and Uncle Franz were bending over him. Don't talk now. Rest. You went? Yes. All the way, Rudy. Herr Captain Winter, guide Franz Lerner, as mayor of Quital, I speak for all mountain men. We hail you with pride. Your feet will be remembered and honored as long as mountains stand and there are men to climb them. There it is, the citadel, and all men will know it by your name. As your prize, your mountain. No. No, you are wrong. Not our mountain. It is Rudy's mountain. Rudy? But how? The boy did not reach the top. Captain Winter walked to where Rudy stood beside his mother. He led the bewildered boy to the long brass telescope. Here before you is the conqueror of the citadel. Look, Rudy, through the telescope. No, Captain. Not I. I only did... You will see. Then all the world will look. And it will see. It was a dream, Rudy thought. But the image in the lens did not fade. It was still there. Across the miles of space, he saw the mountaintop. And from its highest point, there rose a pole. And from the pole, tied by its two sleeves, a red shirt streamed out like a banner against the shining sky. You found it! You carried it up. You put it there. No, Rudy. You put it there. You and your father. 
That is the story they tell of the old days in the Valley of Kurtal, of the conquest of the great mountain called the Citadel, and of how Rudy Matt, who was later to become the most famous of all Alpine guides, grew from a boy into a man.